Welcome to The Practice Podcast, a show created by lawyers to help lawyers in life and business without all the complicated lawyer language. Let's welcome Bast Amron founders and your hosts, Jeff Bast and Brett Amron. Welcome to a special edition of The Practice Podcast. This episode is a recording of a panel discussion from Bast Amron's third annual Business Advantage Forum, which took place on November 13, 2020. The forum is a learning event we host and underwrite each year with all proceeds donated to a charitable organization. This panel is called Supporting Working Parents in a Remote Work Environment. If you enjoy this, please check out the other panels on this podcast and please join us for our next Business Advantage Forum. You can find information on our website at bastamron.com. Griselle has over 20 years of psychological counseling and legal advocacy experience and as counsel for the Employment Law and Diversity and Inclusion Officer at RBI, Griselle dedicates her time to counseling the business on a wide variety of topics from hiring, recruiting, retention, training, coaching, progressive discipline, and making effective choices for company operations. She is also a sought-after lecturer and writer. And born and raised in South Bronx, Ms. Seho is a founding board member of the Ladaris Board of Latino Justice, PRLDEF, which is one of the oldest nonprofit civil rights organizations focusing on education, voting rights, and immigration issues for Latinos. So thank you all so much for being here with us as we move into the afternoon portion of our session. And I welcome you guys this afternoon. I'm really excited about this topic. Obviously, I think just like our last panel, certainly a a timely topic, certainly a a topic that there's been lots of discussion around, but I think each of you bring a unique perspective to this conversation. And I'm excited for you to share that with all of our guests today. So I want to just start out and we're going to kind of frame this in a couple of different ways, not only what you all have done with your companies and what you've seen. But I know, Barry, you bring the unique perspective of working with various companies that ADP represents, and you have some insight on that end as well. So I wanted to talk, first of all, when the pandemic first began and there was this idea that everybody was going to be working outside of the office, what efforts did you all take to make sure that that transition happened in an efficient way, but also securely and to prevent, you know, any kind of challenges that your businesses might have faced from a technological and a security standpoint. So I can definitely speak to that, you know, having had so many offices all over the country that I had to address. And fortunately for Liberty Mutual for many years, and I'm I'm really referring to almost 10 years, we had already gone to what we call an AWE setting, which is alternative work environment where lawyers were working remotely and really just coming into the office once or twice a week as needed. Our biggest challenge was with support staff that was totally based out of the office and how do you situate them? And that was our biggest challenge. But when you ask what did we do first? It was all about communication. People were scared. They didn't know if they were going to lose their jobs. What was their future? You know, they were afraid as to contamination, getting the equipment that they needed, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really a lot of communication at Head Start that really was part of the success of the program. And then gradually we made sure that the equipment was shipped to individual homes as they need it. And what proved to us to be a very successful setup, you know, we never thought that support staff could be totally remote, but because we were already in a paperless environment with lawyers working remotely, it really was much easier to adopt than what we anticipated. And now we're going on what, you know, eight months of that very successfully. So yeah, it was a big struggle, but, you know, I think that logistically, you know, obviously getting computers and chairs and all the different things that they needed was part of it. But I think that a much more concerning point to me was the psychological state of my employees. How did they feel, you know? And we held daily huddles to inform them of all the steps that we were taking, what was being done, when they can expect to get their equipment and answer any questions that they may have. And it was bumpy at the beginning. I'm not going to say that it was totally flawless. You know, people were having internet issues and connectivity issues. You know, the server for Liberty Mutual all of a sudden had thousands of employees all on this server that would normally be based out of the office. So those are the kind of things that were frustrating, but we got through them. Barry, do you want to talk about any yeah. of the security <laughs> issues maybe that were faced? Yeah, I can also just add, I mean, you know, it was, it was such an abrupt change, right? So from ADP, I'm going to bring some of the data, right? So we, we, we did a, a workforce uh, survey 
it's a little stale now. It was in June, but telework in the first week of the pandemic, so right in mid March, about 28% in the US had the availability of telework. By week two, that went up to 44% and more or less leveled off after that. So 41st, you may say, okay, well, that's a good thing, but don't forget that happened in one week. So how many companies necessarily had, you know, the equipment at people's homes? How many companies had the infrastructure, whether they're VPN lines or their internet capacity to make sure that they were able to handle that volume of work? I think there was a, you know, I certainly within ADP, there was a great deal of uncertainty as to whether or not, you know, our network could even handle, in our case, moving 58,000 people to remote work overnight. In our case, it was a good story, but, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of other hiccups. And that technology has been one of the main challenges to move into the remote workforce. And if you look even further beyond that, a lot of times it's not necessarily your internal technology. There was a lot of strain on local ISPs and whether or not internet connectivity was available to workers who were suddenly working remote. I think we've all heard stories of people who, you know, their Zoom starts getting blotchy as soon as a student in the house has to log into their call and they just don't have the bandwidth. So this has been a a real challenge. And I'm not sure that even eight, nine months into it, that it's entirely solved. I think we're making progress and it's getting better, but it's it's still something that's challenging. I think as we think about, the given the fact that the panel is about how to support the parents, it's to your point, Barry Maria is like thinking about the practicality of what that means, right? So for Burger King and Popeyes and Tim Hortons, we have restaurants around the world, so we could see it coming. So we had some leeway time in terms of like understanding we were going to end up remote. We started communications about people are going to have their kids going to school. It's going to be the first couple of minutes is going to be rough. The first couple of hours are going to be rough. And you need to look at your market. So I am born and raised in New York. I practiced in New York for many years. New York really starts at nine o'clock, right? Generally, people start work at nine o'clock. In Miami, a lot of people start at eight and eight thirty. So we had to like issue the directive, like, please do not have meetings before nine o'clock because people are trying to get their children online. Please do not have meetings after five thirty because people need to feed themselves and their children. And there's no gap, right? Whereas before we had parents who were running out of our offices to make sure they picked up their children at aftercare or whatever sport, they don't run out now, but they have the same responsibility, right? The children are still going to log off at 3.30. Many children that had other activities like sports, that kind of went away. So for us, it was starting to communicate the practical experience of having compassion with each other, right? The practical experience of like now it's perfectly fine if somebody's parent or spouse comes into the camera. I can tell you that my colleagues would have been embarrassed or hurt or angry or frustrated had that happened in March, right? But because we had had it happen in our offices in Singapore, we had already seen Switzerland, we started those communications very on. Yeah. Don't make phone calls at the end of the night. There is, I serve burgers, fries, and chicken, right? Like there's nothing that can't wait to tomorrow. If it's after 5.30. And as an attorney, I don't save lives, right? I'm not the oncologist my colleagues are, right? I'm an attorney and we are restaurants. So sometimes it was reminding people like, we're a serious business, we're publicly traded, but you can't take yourself so seriously that you're pushing your talent out, right? And having compassion was probably the critical piece. And it's not just parents, it's people who are in the sandwich generation, right? I have a mother-in-law, and my child, both need attention just as much as my work does. And I need attention. As an introvert, I need a break. So we talked about how do you create breaks? How do we make sure people are having lunch? A lot of my colleagues started working through lunch. They would forget that there was a lunch break. You've got to build it into the culture of the company. Otherwise, people feel guilty or people feel bad. And for us, it was about having a compassionate response to the pandemic. Yeah, I think that's so important. And that kind of leads me into the next question or my next topic, which is, you know, business as usual is now unusual. 
we are getting these glimpses into people's home lives because there are people walking in and out of the cameras or we're hearing about things, you know, that are going on during their day that we may not have been aware of beforehand. And so, you know, working remotely has become the new norm for a lot of bigger companies. Obviously, you know, your employees that are in the Burger King stores are are not working remotely. They're still in, in the restaurants. But at the corporate level, we're seeing this not only now, but we expect that it may go on into the future. And and I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But what is it that you guys have done from a company perspective or things that you maybe wish your company had done to add some flexibility to keep your employees from burning out during this period? We have to balance the fact that in my position, I manage trial lawyers, you know, and so they have to abide by court schedules. And while most of the courts were Zoom at the very beginning, we're now seeing the courts reopening. And there are many have to attend at certain hours. And then that competes with their childcare issues, you know, and and it's stressful. It's stressful for parents. So in our organization, we have used a lot of flexibility. I mean, even with the lawyers them to work work flex schedules you know we have as defense lawyers billable hours you know it doesn't mean that they have to do them within core hours but they do have to meet the court hearings we have flexibility but there are some parameters because as professionals you know we also have an ethical obligation to our clients and so how do we balance that and I have a very large number of lawyers that I oversee so we try to cover hearings for each other as long as they're licensed in the jurisdiction where the events are taking place. We have also demonstrated flexibility in billable hours by reducing that by 25% for those parents or individuals that are caring for the elderly or people who are having other struggles. You know, we're reducing their target. So we have provided a lot of flexibility. And it, quite frankly, I mean, I've told all my direct reports, if you have a good lawyer that's going through a difficult time, I'm not going to lose that lawyer because they are now going through this period of challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to accommodate them as best as I can so we can retain them. And I can tell you that, you know, as a big organization, we do a lot of things. And we recently had the employee opinion survey and the scores were the highest that I've seen. And it was because people were so appreciative of all that we have done to accommodate them. Obviously, you know, Liberty also has the resources of offering mental health support for people that are going through some real struggles, which I think is a good thing. But it's not all easy. I mean, if it was up to me, I would accommodate them completely and say, you know, you're having a bad day. Don't worry about it. You know, work over the weekend, work, you know, whenever you can make it up, as long as your files are all up to date, your clients are up to date. But the problem is that now that's becoming more and more difficult as courts are opening up. I mean, we just had a major trial in Houston a couple of weeks ago, and the lawyers had to pick a jury in an auditorium, and then they moved the panel into the courtroom, and these lawyers had to actually come. Our offices have been closed since the pandemic. I had to reopen it for these lawyers and accommodate. So, you know, there's a lot of circumstances, but I think the key to our success has been our flexibility to accommodate the special needs of the employees. Because like Rissell was saying, you know, people always stay child, but there's also the parent. People have elderly parents and some of the facilities that used to take care of these individuals, children with special needs, those facilities have either closed down or reduced their hours. You have the, the children being homeschooled. This is a reality. And if you're going to eliminate all these wonderful lawyers that are facing this, you're going to be left without a workforce, you know? So you have to work and accommodate them. And you mentioned the reduction in billable hours. Was that something that was just kind of done across the board across to the alleviate board. some of the pressure? Yeah, for any employee having, you know, some, sig- I mean, we want them articulable, you know, they have to tell us what the issue is. And, and we have certainly information on this employee and their track record and, and whatnot, but 25% cushion has been allowed. So basically an eight hour day becomes a six hour day, which is still... I have to tell you, when you're dealing with those issues. But on top of that, we've built in the flexibility that it doesn't all have to be done within the core hours. But you know, Haley, like anything, we run a business too. And clients want to get a call back. They want to know what's happening with their cases. You have to attend the court hearing. So everything within perspective and relativity. If a lawyer is having those challenges and I've already given them the 25% cushion, I also need to hear from them if they're having a problem so I can have someone step in. 
And as I mentioned to, you know, our group, as we were preparing for this, you have to be mindful that you're not tapping on the same person all the time. You know, the single guy that doesn't have kids or parents to worry about or, or gal, you know, you have to be uh, thoughtful not to always be going to not bear them either. So you have to balance it all out. It's increased significantly for my operations manager who helps me with a daily thing, trying to figure out schedules and who can cover what. We're getting more used to it, but it hasn't been easy. Yeah, Maria, you may be ahead of the curve there at Liberty. In the U.S., there's now 39% of employees are reporting that they have more flexibility at work to control their schedules and their time. That's up from 15% pre-pandemic. And in that case, the U.S. actually lags globally, where those numbers are 44% today versus 24% pre-pandemic. So yeah, it's critical to be providing that flexibility for your workforce. Simultaneously, it's super important to understand what the migration is of the workforce, right? So McKinsey's Lean In Foundation just issued a report, I want to say maybe a, a month ago, speaking to how many women are considering leaving their workplace because they're finding these multiple tasks so difficult. And, and I'm not saying that men don't face the same amount of work, but there are dynamics and societal bias whereby a lot of the women are feeling the pressure to be the primary still in the home, the primary caretaker or educator now with kids working, you know, going to school at home. It's super important for us to stabilize, right? For us, the first couple of months is like, how do we stabilize our workforce? We have a group that works remotely, but I have a bunch of people in restaurants, right? So how do you address all of these other issues. And we started by having our managers, three words, how are you? And actually wait for the answer. How are you? And ask it twice, right? Because as a society in the United States, we're conditioned to be like, I'm good, right? But stop and ask, no, how are you? (laughs) Hold your employees, right? Ask, both Maria and Barry talked about polls. We polled our employees in October. We did April, we did July, and then we did October, right? Check to see. How are you is a huge and very powerful statement if used properly. Because if you're managing a workforce and it doesn't matter whether or not they're remote or in, how are you becomes critical. And yes, we have to run a business. Maria's right. I have to run a business. And I have to run a physical business. Right? I have employees who are physically in restaurants, exposed to all kinds of stuff. And I remind my corporate who are working from home every night. We stand on the shoulders of the people that are standing eight-hour shifts. So let's remember that. Because it's so easy to insulate yourself in your space. So for us, it's been driving the idea that Look, we're feeding people who can't feed themselves, right? There are people in this world that can't cook for themselves, that can't take care of themselves, that need the products we sell. And my staff, my corporate staff, needs to remember that, right? It's about mission, right? Mission to the community mission. So I think sometimes reminding our colleagues, whatever your business is, what is your mission? What is your true value in society? What are you offering? Because every company is offering some value. Reminding people of that sometimes when we're eight months in and tired of this, I can say, Maria knows this last week is a rough week for me. And I was tired of being home, tired of being in my room, tired of being the parent, tired of being the attorney. These are normal reactions. And I think when we understand that and acknowledge that and address that, we become better employers. You guys couldn't really be more right. I mean, I don't know if you just intuited through this, but the research really supports everything that you're saying. The three keys in a crisis like this that we found within ADP is that if you encourage remote collaboration and social interaction as people have been forced into this remote working thing, that's, that is key number one. Key number two, communicate with positive messaging. Like try to keep people's spirits up. By the way, that costs nothing, right? <laughs> that's just about culture. And then the third one, which you guys have both sort of touched on, is that you need to focus on your employee safety. Let them know that you're putting people first. And if you can hit these three points, you are going to have a workforce that's going to repay you with their loyalty. We're showing that with our data and our research. What are some of the things that you all have done or, or how your companies have looked at measuring outcomes, right, and key metrics of things? We talked a little bit about 
you know, being flexible and, and as long as the work is getting done, if it's outside of normal working hours, that that's fine. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of talk about that, especially as lawyers, right? Because clients still want an answer. Clients still want to know what's going yeah. on. And, and so, you know, it's important that you're getting back to them quickly and that you're dealing with whatever needs to be addressed in a timely fashion. But we're now doing so much more in our 24 hours than we were before, right? Especially those of us who now have kids that are home or, or don't have aftercare programs or whatever it is. And so those extra couple of hours, I'm now having to do something else and still have to find time to eat, sleep, yeah. you know, exercise if you choose to do that and, and take care of yourself. And so even though there's this flexibility that's, you know, everybody's trying to work with, you're still trying to cram more into the same amount of time. And so how have you adjusted kind of expectations? And I know, Maria, you touched on the shift in the billable hour requirements for some people, but what else are you guys seeing or what else are you guys doing to kind of manage that reality for a lot of people and manage expectations? RBI has been sending out an activity a month to all of our corporate employees. So we sent out a puzzle a whopper, right? We send out a whopper. Like employees are actually the first week of the month, they already know it's coming, right? We send out a how to build a birdhouse that was themed with our chicken or Popeyes. So what we've tried to do is actually encourage the activity within the household in, in order to address issues of having family time, right? We have a walking challenge. So anybody who wants to do it, they post pictures of what they want walking in the morning and what they found. We do treasure hunts that way. So in some ways, we're addressing the humanistic aspect. Then we did the standard corporate stuff, right? We got on the phone and made sure everybody had internet because some of our colleagues, particularly the restaurant employees, don't have internet, right? Don't always have the best internet. So we made sure that anybody who had children had computers. My CEO donated half of his salary for the year to make sure that every employee at the restaurant level that needed to be their children to be remote, that they had computers, that they had internet access. We made the announcement, we're not going to terminate anybody or lower anybody's salary. So gave up his salary for us. That was critical. So we were a small company, although we run large. We're only 1,200 employees, so we're a small company and could do that. But again, it's reminding people, for us, it's reminding people that from a DNI perspective, the inclusion part means I have to include everybody in your household. That's a mental shift. Like, I can't say I'm a DNI officer and not include whatever it is you have going on at home when we're working from home. Yeah, Haley, I think you touched on on productivity, whatever our own personal experiences may be. In the aggregate, productivity is down across the workforce. And that's primarily driven by three reasons. One, technology, which you guys have talked about. Second is stress about the pandemic itself, right? Stress levels are through the roof. It's not anything to pat productivity. And then, you know, to the subject of this panel, it's the family conflicts, right? It's the difficulty of working from home and juggling all of the family, kids in school, older people in the multi-generational households, et cetera. So you would think if those are the causes for decreases in productivity, you know, we, maybe we can, the best employers are trying to address those three items. You know, Haley, I have to tell you, I mean, I look at this issue a little bit more pragmatically with my organization. Clearly, when you do insurance defense work, you look at billable hours. Our target over the past consistently has been on about 97% of target, which I'm amazed that my lawyers are able to achieve that under all the challenges. We measure many metrics, as, you know, client satisfaction, case closure rate, and that kind of thing. And Frankly, it's been very favorable, even to some extent more favorable than pre-pandemic. And I have some explanations for that. You know, in our world, a lot of time is windshield time. You know, there are some jurisdictions that I have where my lawyers drive an hour and a half to get to a court hearing. And now everything is virtual. So they've cut down the time that they need to spend on every file. And that also translates to more work, substantive work being Cases. So as a consequence, these cases are actually moving a little quicker and resolving. Many courts have gone to mediations, mandatory arbitrations. So we're still seeing a closure rate, even though we're not having trials and verdicts. You know, so it's just a different way of doing things. But from my perspective, my department has been quite productive. 
I have not seen, and I'm probably a bit of an exception, you know, because I agree with Barry that overall I hear everyone saying that production went down. I have not seen that as a big of an impact to my legal department. We have seen some trends, you know, it's starting to self-correct. People weren't driving as much. So you, you know, claims went down and lawyers, plaintiffs, lawyers weren't filing as many cases. So we weren't getting as many cases in. So there was a time when I saw my case loads kind of dip a little bit, giving attorneys again, more time to work on the files that they did have. And that may explain again, some of the quicker resolution on cases because they're attending to the cases, but that's starting to come back up. We're seeing the filings, we're seeing the case loads coming back up. So, you know, it's kind of like a mixed review in my experience, but I can't be happier with what my lawyers are doing, even though they are working flex schedules. That's awesome. And, you know, we talked about a little bit, Garcelle touched on this whole idea and the report that came out about women in the workforce and how there's kind of been this mass exodus, if you will. There's over a million women that have left the workforce as a result of this pandemic. And and that's, of course, not to minimize the role that men play in their households and that men play with children and with elderly folks in the home as well. But I wanted to know if you all have seen any effects or that you expect that there will be any long-term effects of that whether it be in your company specifically or, or elsewhere in the workforce, there's an expectation that some women who may have been up for a promotion in the near future or may have been on the road to you know, climb that corporate ladder are now taking more of a back seat because they've had to work you know, a flexible schedule or reduce their hours or take on some of these other invisible mental load issues that we don't normally consider and how that's impacted your workforce or, or people around you. I mean, I can certainly see how that can play a role in certain, particularly the private firms where, I mean, my understanding has always been that it's important to a firm to bring in business, you know? So if spending time taking care of the children or attending to other matters takes away from that, I can see where that could potentially have an impact. I'm just speculating on this because that's not my playing field. I can tell you that within my organization, I have not allowed it to impact. But again, you know, this is where we talk about having diversity in our organization. As a diverse leader, I can relate to that female lawyer or male lawyer that's taking care of a child. And I can tell you that I recently went through a sweep of all my employees trying to identify new team leaders, people that I want to put in my pipeline for future leadership positions. And I selected women that I know right now are struggling with childcare issues. I did not allow that to impede my choices, but I'm not sure that everyone would think the way I do. And that's the problem, you know, whether we like it or not, it is a male dominated profession and the partners mostly are male and they're looking, you know, for the billable hours, the business that's coming in. And going back to the last panel, if we really want to have a diverse workplace and we want to have people that look differently and think differently and have different challenges in their lives, you know, I think that businesses need to be open to the idea that they're going to have to have different markers in determining how people get promoted to those positions and be willing to accommodate someone that perhaps is not working as many hours, but is bringing in a different type of value. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. So also wanted to talk about the different ways that your companies or Barry, you know, what you've seen with some of the companies that ADP works Mm -hmm. with, how they've shifted in their training and coaching of either current employees in different roles or with new hires and how that has shifted in this remote environment? I think it's a challenge, right? Depending at the level and what kind of position it may be, there's a lot of technology involved in training and worker education these days. There's a lot of online training, but onboarding, look, I don't think you can substitute for face-to-face when you're onboarding someone, trying to bring them into an organization and have them really have a feel for a culture rather than just maybe what their tasks are. You know, we can do our best over Zoom, but I, you know, look, I I hate to say it, I think something's going to be lost, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree with Barry on that. It's tough, you know, because even though we've had remote lawyers for years, we definitely require that at the very minimum, the first 90 days are in the office. And of course, the senior managing lawyer of every office is always in the office. So I think back to my legal career and when I started, how wonderful it was that I could walk down the hallway and go into a senior lawyer's office and brainstorm 
a set of facts, a legal issue. You know, you can't substitute that because when you're doing it by Zoom, it requires a setting. It's a very formal thing. Hey, I need your help. Can you make time for me? We're going to set up that call. That's very different than the accessibility you have being in an office and just walking down the hallway and talking to a colleague or while you're grabbing coffee in the lunchroom and someone says, hey, what are you working on? And, you know, you brainstorm. To me, that all goes into mentoring, you know, and we don't have that right now. I think that is, in my opinion, one of the biggest handicaps that we have in a virtual world, frankly. We have tried to make up for it by having, you know, virtual mentoring. I I have a program in which I match lawyers from all over the country with other lawyers, and they meet on a periodic basis. We have daily huddle calls that, you know, every office gets together, and they talk about what they have going on that day, and certainly they can bring up an issue. We have roundtables. All of these things can be done virtually, but nothing substitutes for that ability to just walk down the hallway and get some advice or, you know, go grab lunch with one of the senior attorneys or partners and learn from them, you know, watch them take a deposition that you are able to do so because you're in the same physical office. Those things, we can't kid ourselves. That's where we will have some handicaps. I completely agree with Maria. And Barry, it's, it's a different sort of world. And we've been onboarding new employees. For those people, I just feel badly, right? Because it's very hard. So our offices are normally all personnel are in. We actually have FaceTime requirements. <laughs> For us, we've started with the training is train managers on how to do this remote things, right? So like how to call and say, how are you? With any new employee, we've asked the managers, give them the coffee chat list, right? The five people that this new employee should set up a coffee chat with so that they can get some of that interaction, there is a significant loss of institutional knowledge when you can't just walk around the office and meet people. That loss is something that we are trying still to strategize about, right? Like I'm trying to strategize even as I speak here, but we've started to say, give the coffee chat list, right? And have people understand that those coffee chats, they're not a suggestion, (laughs) They really are like, these are the five people you need to reach out to in the next two weeks, right? Um, Because we also had an issue initially where people thought that the managers would just kind of like, hey, if you want, these are the five people. And it's like, no, no, this is the five people, right? So even when we've tried to address the issue of not having the huddle time or the coffee cup grab, we are trying to address how to get coffee cups. We use Teams. Teams has a software available that's called Icebreaker. So on Mondays at noon, it'll send to employees anywhere in the world. You've been matched for this week and it's on the two employees to kind of set up a coffee chat. I've actually met more of my colleagues in, in Singapore in the last six months that we, since we've been doing it than I ever knew. But I don't have a perfect solution. I have a perfect problem. I have a perfect storm, right? I have a perfect storm. I'm still trying to strategize. So if anybody has any kind of suggestions, that chat box is there for a reason. <laughs> use it. I would appreciate it. I'm sure other people would too. Barry, did you want to add anything before I move to my next? No, I kind of. I would. I would agree with everything Griselle and Maria said. I mean, you you kind of have to force it, right? It's not going to happen serendipitously. You're not going to like just you know happen to run into someone in the hallway. You got to schedule time, and you know, like I do that with my team. I schedule coffees, and you know, my rule is video on, no agenda. You know, you got to bring coffee and, you know, whether we talk about work or what happened over the weekend or the weather, like, I don't care. Like, you just need to kind of establish that connection with people, know that they have those lines of communication, especially as a manager, you know, that you're thinking about them, right? But, you know, is that the same as literally meeting over the coffee machine? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's second best, but we've got to try to do whatever we can. Absolutely. And as a spinoff of what Gersal was saying, so... The idea that onboarding people and and training new people or or even current employees to move into a new role could be more challenging in this remote work environment and and whether that's right now in the current pandemic or next year as some companies maintain this remote working environment. Are you seeing, and whether it's you personally or heard stories anecdotally, that people are looking for maybe some different attributes in new hires that they wouldn't have otherwise considered, right? Are you looking for people who, you know, may be more resilient or, or may, you know, seem like they can adapt to having less of the traditional onboarding 
than you know may have previously been available? Is that something that's factoring into your decision and how? I gotta say, not for me. I still look for the hungry, hardworking, and the humble. So I don't know, Maria or Barry, either. Yeah, I mean, this is an area to be very careful with, particularly as you're recruiting uh, more lawyers that did not grow up in an age of technology. You know, it's becoming less of an issue because even the older lawyers have become tech savvy, you know. But yes, I mean, my operation has been paperless even pre-pandemic and an absolute requirement is that the person be techie, you know, that they know how to navigate through the computer and work in a paperless environment and be able to have three monitors in front of them and have their court file, their claims file, and their working file, and be able to navigate and do all that. And sometimes, you know, I've come across lawyers that are fantastic trial lawyers. I'd love to bring them on, but if they can't operate in that world, they're going to fail in my organization, you know? So has that been stepped up a little bit in this time? I don't think so. I think it's just been the same for me for a while, but that's kind of in part because I have been remote even pre-pandemic. But I would imagine that anyone looking to hire someone right now needs to have someone that would be resilient to the flexibility that is called for under the challenges that we're all operating under. Yeah, hey, you use that word resilience. I mean, you should really always be hiring and training for resilience, right? I don't, I don't think that that's specific to the pandemic. It's a, right. it's a key attribute of successful organizations is that they build resilience and that they build resilience in their employees. Personally, I think... I don't know about the resilience so much as being able to work autonomously because maybe, you know, as managers, it's just it's a little bit harder to be there for every little thing. And sometimes you just got to expect in this remote environment that people are going to be able to take tasks, projects, cases, contracts, whatever. They're just going to have to be able to run with them themselves, right? I think it's much harder to be a manager and you know, kind of be shoulder to shoulder with all of your employees and working through matters with them. They're just going to have to start to run with it themselves. Right. Absolutely. So Jeff actually posed a question in the chat that was going to be my next topic. So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is how we're engaging with our employees and with our teams through all of these, you know, whether it be a Zoom happy hour or a coffee chat or or whatever it is, but people are experiencing this real Zoom fatigue, right? That they sit in front of their computer all day with their camera on, talking to whoever or on a hearing or a mediation or or whatever it may be. And so how do you separate that or what are you doing to combat that in a way that can keep your team engaged and connected, but isn't just more screen time, if you will? Maybe that's a tough one because there's yes. no other <laughs> time, time, you know? <laughs> I can tell you that connectivity is absolutely key to keep engagement as high as you can. I referenced earlier the daily huddles. Uh, so we have daily huddles that are always at the same time so people can plan around them and everyone joins in. It's basically a time, like I said, to discuss what's going on in the office, probably what you would do if you were live, but we do it remotely. And some of the teams do have like the special happy hours, you know, that they do after hours and that I don't oversee that or overlook that. I don't even know what they're talking about, but I think that's important. Some people are closer to others, so they connect it in other ways. But as an organization in the legal department, I do demand the daily huddles. Then I have meetings with my direct reports bi-weekly and I cut that back. When the pandemic started, I had them daily. And then when things kind of like settled down a little bit, I have them once a week and now I have them bi-weekly. And in part, because I'm sensitive to the burnout, I'm sensitive to the fact that people are sick of Zoom meetings, you know? So bi-weekly, I think is good for now. I've been debating whether I can go back to my once a month. That may be a little bit kind of stretching it. It's all about communication. If you can find another mode, but really no one's getting together live. So at least I can't think of any other way of doing it. Yeah, it's a tough question. I hesitate to think that the answer to Zoom fatigue is more Zoom meetings, right? So <laughs> I'm, right. Not, I'm not really sure. <laughs> not really sure how to address that one. That's a tough one. Yeah. Some people are picking up the phone instead, where you're still getting that, you know, connection with somebody and you're getting voice to voice, but you don't have to sit in front of the computer. You could be on a walk, you could be out with your kids, you could be, you know, maybe doing some other things while you're connecting with coworkers. So I think that's one option. And I think there's also a question, right? Obviously, this panel is specifically about the remote work environment. But, you know, when and if do you think there will be some kind of transition to 
some type of socially distant get together where, you know, your team sits around in a park or, you know, somewhere where they can maintain their distance and have their mask on? Like, is that in our future? Or, you know, are we going to be confined to our computer screens for the next (laughs) indefinite period of time? I think that's an option. And the other Day, I got a call from my team in New Orleans and they did just that. They went out to lunch and they went to an outdoor restaurant and they all said they took a picture so I could see them, which I thought was funny. And they were all spread out in this huge table, but they were enjoying lunch together. And I thought it was good. I mean, if that's what made them feel a little bit more connected, I think you have to be open, you know, to other ideas that they may bring to the table. And I think that's the key. Just listen to your employees. Sometimes they're the best uh, judge of when something like that can be done. Yeah, I had the same experience. I have a really strong leader of a team up in New Jersey and he did a happy hour, a door happy hour yeah. a few weeks ago and got the team together. I think it went over really, really well. Back to Haley's point before, you know, I try to look for spots in my calendar where I have a call that's maybe audio only. See if I can kind of take that walking, like just walk around the neighborhood. Try not to run into Mark Stein and Otis, but you know, <laughs> I'll, uh, well. <laughs> and I will tell you another thing. I noticed that some of my team members don't always like to be on camera. And I respect that, you know. So I always try to be on camera so they can at least have some connectivity with me. But I'm okay if people just want to have their name up, you know, because I understand sometimes. And, you know, some of them have told me, hey, you know what? I didn't want to do my hair today and do my makeup. I have no court hearings. I'm in my pajamas. And that's fine. You know, you just got to be. So I don't insist that I see their faces, you know, even though we are in a Zoom call. And you have to be open to that. I just always try to make myself visible so that they feel some connection, you know. I'll come on with like my hair wet or, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, this hair frizzes. I'll come out with the hair like up in arms because as a leader, I want to make it okay, right? I want to make it okay. If you do want to come on the call with your hair like frizzed out, I have clothes on. I never not wear like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, shirts and pants and things like that. But sometimes I have shorts and I have a habit and I've done it while we're here. I move around a lot because I sit on my legs. I don't know why. I've always done it. But I'll tell them I have shorts on, y'all. And I want to normalize the space, right? As a leader in DNI, it's about normalizing and breaking those social constructs that we have. Like you had to wear a suit if you were an attorney. You have to, you know, you have all these things. I put on lipstick because I was on this call. Otherwise, I don't have lipstick. There's no need for me to wear lipstick. Ain't nobody here going to see it. It doesn't make a difference as to who I am as an attorney. However, I know that as an attorney, you expect to have your hair and makeup done, right? So some of it is breaking what are normal social constructs because this pandemic broke it. And I'm just reflecting that. But yeah, some people don't get on the call in the legal department. So I'm one of those employees. <laughs> that got together with her colleagues. So one of our colleagues has a huge backyard in Coconut Grove. And she said, hey, whoever wants to come, come. We all brought our own bottle of wine. We were told which bottle to bring, right? We all brought our own bottle of wine and sat. She had enough faces and she marked off the face. It was the best afternoon I've had in years. But that was for us. And not every attorney had to come. It was whoever wanted to come. She just sent out a text. Whoever wants to come, I'm opening up this bottle. Maria and I are friends outside of this internet world. And I'm like, I'm waiting for the day that I can see Maria. There's a piece of me that needs and feeds. I'm a Latina, so I'm all about family. And there's a piece of me that needs that interaction. And it doesn't have to be on the camera. But there's a physicality, a tangible need that I do have that I didn't realize I had until I got stuck in my four walls for eight months. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important. I was going to add another thing about cameras on. You know, when we deal with our clients, in my case, generally my clients are not necessarily the individuals that we represent, but leaders within the organization, particularly claims or home office. And generally speaking, these people in the office and we would meet in a very formal setting and conference room or, you know, it was always a very business-like setting where you know nothing about this personal, personal life. And so the idea of Zoom, and we're going to talk about some of the pluses, is that you get to see these people not in their best day suit with their dog or their kid coming in. You get to meet the family. 
And frankly, some of those relationships have actually improved because of that, because you get to see another extension of this person. You almost get a little bit into their personal life by having that access to the call through this video in their home with whether it be their child or their dog. And I can think of one individual in particular who was always like, very businesslike and stern. Anytime he walked in, he had, I mean, well-dressed guy, you know, in his suit. And now I see him with overgrown beer, a t-shirt, his dog is barking in the background. And, you know, sometimes he's half embarrassed over it happening. But the fact that I've kind of seen a little bit more of him, it's actually improved communication, you know, because we'll talk about his dog and he'll talk about mine because you guys may have already heard mine. He's snoring in the background. He's my shadow bulldog and I can't get him away from me. Otherwise he'll be barking at the door. So you get to connect in different modes with these individuals. So that's been helpful. Sometimes you don't think about it. It's kind of like one of the benefits of it. Yeah. I think that's super important. There was a question in the chat about whether or not you guys feel like seeing people's home lives and seeing what's going on with your employees has allowed people to connect in a different way. And I would love for you all to just kind of share, you know, what that insight has done for your teams or for your business generally and how you think you'll find ways to keep it that way or to incorporate that post-pandemic. We do a town hall, a weekly global town hall, and we have a session called Cribs. where one in each area. So it's Singapore, APAC, Latin America, Canada, and the U.S. Somebody will volunteer to walk us through their home and introduce us to their whatever. So we've been introduced to fur babies, real babies, mothers, brothers, siblings. Someone introduced us to his plant, which is the best one, I think, yet, right? And it has helped create a sense of unity that we could not have achieved pre-pandemic. Like there was just, I can't imagine. We've tried to normalize the crazy. Right. And I call it COVID crazy because that's what it is. Right. There's, I'm, I love Christmas. I'm Christmas crazy. And now I have to deal with COVID crazy. So. I guess that's what I was speaking to earlier that it has, I think, bonded some of us a little bit more by understanding their home setting. Something that we haven't discussed, but I think we need to be sensitive to. You know, I do have some employees that are that have just gotten out of school a year or two ago that are either still living at home with their parents or grandparents, or live in a small studio or apartment. And working at home is not necessarily comfortable for them, you know, because even though they like the idea of flexibility, some of these were the lawyers that often came into the office. One young man comes to mind and he lives at home with his grandparents and an extended family. And so he doesn't always have all the quiet space that he needs. And when he is on camera, he always has the virtual background. And I understand, and I was, you know, there's no reason, there's nothing wrong with that. So you have to sort of be sensitive to those employees that are also struggling through the setup and that you, you know, accommodate that as best you can. He still finds a way to cover all his hearings virtually without interruption, but it is a challenge. And this pandemic has given me a better insight into the struggles that he works through, you know? And so we need to be sensitive to that as well. That's a critical point. I imagine that this audience is probably not representative of the the broader workforce that is working from home these days. And, you know, a lot of people are, you know, we're certainly seeing it in our business. They're they're struggling with the work from home, right? I mean, they, Mm -hmm. they might not have the space. They might have too many people in their households. People are working from kitchen tables and in laundry rooms and whatnot. Not, you know, not everybody's, you know, is, is focused on, on their Zoom background or has the luxury to really kind of have maybe a home office, for example. So, you know, I think you have to be sensitive to that. Yes, absolutely, Barry. Another question that I think is super interesting, and, and I know we had an experience in our office, Alejandra was commenting in the chat, but have any of you had an employee that ended up with COVID or, or that had a family member with COVID how did you all handle that and how did it impact your offices? We send them food. So there's a group of us that volunteered to use our Instacart account to send them food. Look, corporate is remote. If you have COVID, get off the camera, rest, take care of yourself. It doesn't necessarily change what we have to do. It's just like anybody being sick. But for those that are parents, and I know that this panel is about parents, we will reach out to the family member or whoever's the emergency contact to figure out like, what do you guys need us to buy? Because usually we'll say, what do you guys need us to buy? And they're like, no, no, we've got them. Like, 
no, no, no. We've got a whole team. Just tell us, what do you need? Give us a list, right? Again, it's that same, like, how are you? Oh, I'm good, right? So for us, it's like, what do you need? What do you want? Do you like ice cream? Like, do you have kids? Do you want things that are microwavable? So we've had some colleagues who are like, I need stuff that's microwavable because my kids are old enough that they can do that. I've had some colleagues who are like, do we need a break? And I'm like, okay, so let's figure out how we can give a break. And we'll set up like a Zoom play date with our colleagues' children, like separate, right? So that's what we've done. I love that idea, entertaining the kids so that the parents can get a little bit of, whether it's to work or to rest, to you know have that opportunity to kind of step away from the kids for a little bit. Anybody else that have had experiences with it? It's a great idea, Grisel. We haven't done that. I mean, basically, we've had many employees impacted because it's such a large organization. So Liberty has been extremely flexible with time off. You know, no questions asked. You know, they can just enter COVID in their time sheet and that's all that needs to be done. And it's not just for the individual employee, but those that are caring for people in their household with COVID. So in that respect, we've been super, super flexible. But I love the idea, Grisel. I'm going to actually steal it from you. <laughs> It's actually not necessarily optional, right? I mean, there is there there are there is an expansion of uh, FMLA and yeah, exactly, <laughs> and emergency paid sick leave, right? So. Exactly, absolutely. But it's paid leave in in this case, right. you know, whereas FMLA isn't. Liberty has not docked anyone's pay for their time off due to COVID, nor is it eating into their sick time or vacation time. It's over and above. That's yeah, great. We, we we don't fall under that regulation either, but. Our colleagues have 14 days. We've also done that for our restaurant colleagues. And we also did it separately for restaurant colleagues that were high risk. So I have colleagues who have had cancer, have heart condition, diabetes, you name it. And what we did, again, because it's still donation, starting March, they were put on work from home. We didn't realize, obviously, that eight months later, they would be working from home. So has committed to another year of it. So our colleagues who have had years of experience standing in a restaurant for eight hours a day can rest. And we're trying to be a human company. We take DNI to the next level because we can, right? And there are limitations to every company and to the business. But ultimately, we decided as a company that the inclusion part was going to be what we were going to focus on for 2020. It just happens to be a pandemic kind of roll on it, right? So that's why we've been trying to be say groundbreaking. We're not groundbreaking. We're just being human. I think that the humane side of it, right? This human connection is something that for a lot of people and for a lot of companies may have been missing from the workplace pre-pandemic. There's a lot of focus on bottom line. There's a lot of focus on, you know, being a income producing business and that you're there to do a job and you get your job done and you go home and and that's the end of it. We are very lucky that at our firm, we have a very family oriented culture, not just with our own families, but that we are a family within our firm. But I think a lot of people are now experiencing this need to connect and this humane side of things that they may not have had before in the workplace. And and for me, I I hope that's something that continues going forward post-pandemic, that people are more sensitive to what other people may have going on, you know, outside of work or even in work that, you know, is important to know more about who they are as a person and the types of challenges that they may be facing, because it's something that everybody's experiencing, you know, together, which is unique. I noticed that Jeff brought up a point about sharing the information with the office. And I have to tell you, that's evolved a little bit. Like it's becoming more accepting that people are okay with you sharing it. I found that at the beginning, people didn't want us to share that they got COVID. I had many employees that tested positive that requested that it be kept confidential. So it was only, I knew and HR knew, but that was, and so I couldn't tell the office. And yet you needed to make accommodations to cover the schedule. So you have to be to that because some people do not want others to know. Yeah, I think that's important. You know, I think it also obviously depends on your environment, right? If your office is not 100% remote and there's a chance that people could have been exposed to this person or or something like that. And and I know Alejandra is commenting in the chat that, you know, it was important to her that everybody know 
that if they had been in contact with her so that they had an opportunity to get tested or, or do what they wanted to do or, or self-impose a quarantine. Whereas if your office is 100% remote and there's no chance that any of your other employees came into contact with this person, it's less important to you know maybe share who it is that's been impacted. But it also gives other people the opportunity to reach out and be empathetic. And you know, like Grisel said, offer to deliver groceries or do something like that, that, you know, could be really appreciated and needed at that point. Absolutely. So we only have a couple more minutes and I think it's important that we kind of end before I'm going to open it up. I know people have been asking questions in the chat, but want to give people an opportunity to ask some more, but I wanted to just talk about what it is that you all see going forward. What are the types of things that your companies are thinking about now as we lead into 2021 and not to say that that means the pandemic's going to be over we all know that that this is something we're going to be facing for a while but what are some of the things that you guys are thinking of as long term goals and long term strategies to either accommodate a more of a work from home type environment or these types of situations that might arise in the future so there's been extensive planning within liberty mutual i mean one of the issues that we're addressing is our real estate footprint. You know, we have come to realize, especially some of our smaller offices and remote areas, not the big cities, really don't need that physical building, that they operate perfectly well. So we're looking to see which leases we're going to be renewing and which ones we're not. That's one aspect of our evaluation. The other one has to do with, you know, when we come back, how we're going to do it. It's going to be through phases, obviously. And really, I don't know that we're ever going to, or at least right now, we're not planning on a 100% remote. I think we're even thinking about support staff working 50-50. 50 from home, 50 from the office. It also will allow for more uh, spreading out physical offices that we remain open. So there's actually a lot going on. While a lot of it is centered around the well-being of our employees, a lot of it is also very business-driven, you know, because we all know leaders of businesses that your biggest cost of running any operation is real estate and salary. So if you're really paying for space that is very disposable, you know, in other words, you don't really need it to operate efficiently. And I can tell you, I mean, I have like little offices in Omaha, Nebraska that has four lawyers. I mean, do I really need to have that? It's clearly demonstrated to me that they can work remotely. Do I need to renew that lease? Probably not, you know? So we're going around the country kind of looking at that. That's been one of our evaluations. And I know maybe that's not the answer you were looking for, but that has gone into our evaluation of the return to work plan. Yeah, I think there's there's probably two elements to that. I mean, first, you need to be really careful about how you return to work if you want to go back to the office. So like the businesses that I support, we actually can provide playbooks and support for getting back to the office safely, right? So it's it's really critical. And, you know, I know a lot of companies, including ADP, as they ease back into the office, they're taking a really slow and careful approach. Like it's strictly voluntary, limited numbers of people getting back. And then all, of course, there's all the physical precautions, right? Whether it's temperature checks and touchless doors and, you know, sinks and whatever it may be, the social distancing. So that's basically table stakes. But then in terms of, you know, making your employees feel comfortable, you know, we're doing like, we were offering a daily survey. So as each employee is ready to go back into the office, they kind of fill out a little survey. How do you feel? Not just how do you feel, like, are you sick? But how do you feel in terms of your comfort level with returning to the office. So businesses that are getting back into the office, moving people that have been remote for a long time, really need to think long and hard about how they're going to do that and take the right approach so that they can, of course, keep their people safe, but also keep their people engaged and happy to be getting back to the office. I think, Haley, you had asked kind of long-term impacts and notwithstanding the the cost of, of real estate. We never went fully work from home. Obviously, we have restaurants that we run, so people are working in the office. For our corporate employees, we're already at phase two. We own a building in Miami, and it allows for, I want to say, up to 150 individuals to come into the office. You sign up for it. We have the the pre-questions. We have the testing when you get in. It allows for 150. The max we've ever hit is 20 people. And we opened it when Governor DeSantis opened the the state. Uh, So we've actually done the experiment of letting people back, right? And they don't seem to want to. I don't know what the future brings for RBI. I think 
we started a slow based approach in order to be able to see what people's comfort zones were. We have the anonymous surveys and sometimes those give you wonderful data, right? But something like a realistic, like, okay, if you guys want to come, sign up. And our average is 10 to 12 individuals. That gives us just as much data as any survey does. So we're in the process of what we're going to consider and how we're going to consider it. We have boots on the ground and there's a piece of us that has to remember that. So I don't have to go into the office, but I do travel to restaurants in Miami-Dade once every other Friday, right? Because if I'm asking my colleagues to work in restaurants, I sure as hell be able to serve that prize. So, you know, get the chicken out and, and give the coffee. So I think it's so it's important as a leader. Anybody want to wrap up with any final thoughts just about maybe how this has impacted you personally as a remote work employee, as a working parent, as somebody who has, you know, elderly parents in the home as well? How has it affected you over the last couple months? I'm tired. (laughs) I'm with you. (laughs) I'm tired, right? I'm on Zoom calls all day. I have a colleague, Robin Schaefer, whom I love. So Robin at 1230, we all Remember, we're all in the office and we have an open space concept. Robin would shoot up at 12.30 and be like, all right, people, I'm going to lunch. Who's coming with me, right? It was an announcement, but she invited everybody. In some ways, it meant that down to the cafeteria, there might be five of us or 20 of us all at the same time because she, she just said it with such authority and such gusto that it became the way we bonded as a legal team. I need to channel my inner Robin because it's now almost two o'clock. I haven't had lunch. I've been eating the Snickers bar while we're here. That's a normal day for me, right? I love my family, but I'm an introvert. So sometimes I just need to go for a walk without the dog, without the daughter, without the husband, without the mother-in-law. And yet I'm so thankful that I work for the company that I work for. and so grateful that I didn't suffer loss of benefits, loss of salary, loss of anything, loss of life, right? But how has it affected me? I love my wall. I hate my wall all at the same time. Yeah, I appreciate you you sharing that. And Jeff made a good comment. Stay tuned for our next panel because we're going to talk about all of the different ways to both internally and externally help with that burnout and that stress and that just exhaustion that I know a lot of us are feeling. Barry, you want to share? There's good and there's bad to it, right? I mean, there are definitely advantages to working from home. I I was never a work from home guy. I mean, maybe here and there, a half a day, you know, a couple times a year. I mean, I was, I had a routine. I got in my car, I drove to the office, I worked a day and I can't, I mean, and so I've learned that there are aspects of it that I love, but at the same time, there's a lot about the office that I miss. That's sort of my take on working from home. I, I guess in my fantasy world, I'd do some kind of hybrid when this is all over. But more broadly, you know, pandemic stuck. And I really hope this is the last one that I ever have to see because it's just, it's caused so much, I mean, aside from the death and the sickness, of course, right? But I mean, just, you know, there's just so much disruption in every aspect of life, whether it's work and school. And, you know, I think the, the title of our session on the parenting and, you know, it's just, it's, it's really been a drag and that vaccine can't get here fast enough for me. Thanks. Maria? I agree with Barry, good and bad. I mean, there's some things that obviously I like, but a lot that I don't like. One of the things that for me has really impacted me, and I know many of you can share this same sentiment, I'm working longer hours than ever because there's no parameters. You know, when we went into the office, I got up in the morning, had my coffee, read the paper, got dressed, which I miss, feeling professional. (laughs) Went into the office, I saw people and, you know, I worked long days. I was never out of the office before 6 p.m. You know, I, when I closed up shop at the office. I came home, had dinner with my husband. And unless it was an emergency, I really didn't go back on my computer. Whereas now I'm on it all the time. And because my husband has a home office, my son is doing law school remotely. I gave up my home office and I have a breakout from my master bedroom that has an area where I set up my office. So I'm staring at my master bedroom while I'm working the whole day. You know, I go to sleep looking at my desk. That's not healthy, you know? And so I do miss the days that I could put my suit on and put my lipstick on, go to work and put a full day because I never work less than a 10 hour day, but done, you know, and I have a workforce that I've told you can be flexible with your hours. So if they have an issue late at night, 
you know, they call their manager, their manager calls me, there's no boundaries. And I'm tired of that. (laughs) Yeah, I totally can appreciate pieces of what each of you have said. I obviously am physically in the office today. What our firm has done is kind of a hybrid situation where we're broken up into different teams and we rotate in and out of the office one week on and one week off, which allows, like Grisel mentioned, for spacing, you know, that there can be less people in and and allow for that distancing and also time to clean in between the groups and, and things like that. But I'm the same way, Maria. My office setup is in our master bedroom of my two bedroom condo. I have a daughter who's going to be three next month and she's thankfully back in preschool, but she has to be picked up at 2.30 every day. And so between, you know, 2.30 and 6, which is when I generally try to shut things off, I'm trying to juggle a lot of things. And so I'm with you. I I miss being in the office. I miss being able to connect and, and socialize and bounce ideas off of one another just by walking into somebody's office. But we are getting a little bit of that because, you know, we're in a couple of days a week or every other week. So I think it's a balancing act of trying to figure out what works for you and, and what works for your company. And hopefully eventually we'll we'll all figure out what that magic combination is. But thank you guys so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. I think this was a really valuable conversation that a lot of us took some ideas away from that we can bring back to our own offices. And thank you so much. For more information on this show and other resources, visit fastamron.com and connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram at fastamron.com.